like the beauty of our job because every day is a new day. You're not doing the exact same thing. Hello, everybody. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 452. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Miss Lauren Mary Kim. If you don't know me, I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for this show, founder at Whistlekick, and a passionate traditional martial artist, karate, taekwondo, kung fu, Filipino martial arts, you name it. I love it, and I've done a lot of it. And here on the show, I take that knowledge, that experience, and I get to talk to a lot of really cool people. And if you want to see more of those really cool people I've talked to, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, sign up for the newsletter, look at the photos, read the transcripts, find the links. There's a ton of stuff over there. Every single episode we've ever done is available for free. And why do we bring you this show twice a week for free? Because we hope that you'll support us and you'll go to whistlekick.com and you'll make a purchase, whether it's a shirt or a uniform or some protective equipment or any of the other many, many things that we've got going on. Make a purchase. Show some love. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that'll get you 15% off and helps us know that you made that purchase because of this show. After all, the goal of the show is to connect, educate, and inspire traditional martial artists around the world. Let's talk about today's guest. There are a number of ways that you may know Miss Kim, but likely it's from something on screen. She's been compared to some pretty prominent martial artists of history, and she does some incredible work. And I was fortunate enough to get to talk to her. And in the episode, she talks a lot about her past, her present, and pays homage to a pretty amazing martial arts instructor that she's been fortunate enough to train with, a name that I think you'll recognize. But instead of me digging into that, let's let her dig into that so here we go. Miss Kim, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate you being here. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yes, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we're going to get into a lot of different stuff. We're going we're gonna to wander around. We're going to talk about you and, and your career and path through the martial arts. And I'm sure we'll get into tons of other stuff. Great. But we always, we, we always start off in this kind of it sounds boring way, but we got to do it because it's a martial arts show. So <laughs> how'd you first find martial arts? Man, okay. So unlike some people, I actually started a lot later in my life. I was actually a dancer my whole life. So I was very physical, you know, since a very young age, always using my body, you know, because I started with like tap dancing, acrobatics, ballet, modern dance, jazz. So I was very familiar with, you know, uh, classes and uh performances i guess you could say and then uh i moved to la and i was uh taking an adult gymnastic class and i met a bunch of stunt guys and all of them were trained martial artists and they were doing some kicks um you know some mitt drills um and i was like wow what is that i want to learn and so they they literally put me under their wing and started training me just on the side um and they they all had uh taekwondo backgrounds so I was like, I want to do this. So I enrolled into a Taekwondo school called Jun Chong Taekwondo in Los Angeles. Uh, and that's how I first was introduced to martial arts. And that's how the first martial art I started, actually. And what did you notice about the similarities and the differences between dance and Taekwondo? It's like a sequence of movement, right? It, it is definitely that. And even though dance does it to music, Martial arts is more to the rhythm of other people, whether you're sparring or if you're doing a form with another person. So you're in sync with other people in some type of way. So I don't know. It's just a, a magical way to use your body, I guess. And whether it's an aggressive or uh, combative or dance performance or a form, which is also performance. Um, yeah, I think it's just an amazing, beautiful thing that it just really resonated with me. Do you still dance? No. <laughs> <laughs> I uh I don't know I guess I got burnt out with the whole dance community and everything and the whole like classes and the I don't know I once I fell into martial arts I never looked back and I just kept doing that and I kept you know like exploring new martial arts and I don't know dance was something that was just in my past now but I still 
love watching people dance and um, I have definitely still have appreciation for it for sure. What kind of dance did you do? Uh, I did. I started in like tap, ballet, lyrical jazz, like all those kind of things. I did like the whole recitals when I was a kid, competitions. And so martial arts, it sounds like kind of filled that same niche or void. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. And I um, transformed it into doing stunt work. So after I met those stunt guys, they literally helped me get into the business, a business I didn't even know about. And as you all see on film and TV, there's a lot of fight scenes and he uses a lot of different martial art techniques and different types of martial arts. So, um, yeah, I was able to transition into that career path easily. Um, and it's been awesome. It, it's made me explore different types of martial arts. So I first started in Taekwondo and then I did some Wushu. And then after that, I went to, uh, Guru Dan in Osanto school in Rana Del Rey. And that's where I trained um, C Lot, JKD, Muay Thai, uh, Filipino martial arts. And then I also go to Fit Arts and I train with Alfred Kendrick at, um, for uh, Capoeira. So, oh, nice. yeah, it's been like a journey. So, uh, I, I always want to learn something new. So, I just, it's just opened my eyes into this whole new world that I never had when I was a child. So, I'm, it, it's kind of cool to do it as an adult, I think, sometimes. Mm, absolutely. And, and we'll talk more about that. But there's something you said that I want to I go back and unpack. We've had a few stunt folk on the show. And for each of them, it's something that you know, they, were, they were really into, something they were really doing everything they could to push into that aspect of film. And I, I have a few friends now who are working really, really hard to try and crack into that. But this kind of fell in your lap. And, and I, don't, I don't say that to, to belittle it or anything, mm-hmm. but, but it's not a, easy work. <laughs> no, it's not like I just met these stunt guys and then just start working. I had to train for several years and like to get a job. It took a long time. Um, like I would book a job and then I would not book another job for several months after. So that's why I had to continue dancing because stunts was not paying the bills in the beginning and it you know there you know the first five years was difficult because you had to learn the skills uh, meet people and then when i started the business was a lot closer so no no one really wanted to take a chance on new people so it was harder for us to get you know bigger gigs or gigs at all because they don't trust you or know you so yeah it took time for me to develop my career I mean, I've already been in the business for 15 years now. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say it was an easy and smooth path, but. I didn't think it, I didn't think it had been. That's why I I wanted to go back and I wanted to clarify. But if you've been in it for 15 years now, you know, you're certainly seeing some success. What is it about stunts? Because from everything I understand about it, it's really hard work and it's physically grueling in a way that I think even general martial arts training is not. It's, it's, it seems to be even more so from what we've heard on the show. Yeah. I mean, every job, that's the beauty of the stunt business because every job literally is completely different. So I was on a job uh, for six months in Atlanta and we had to do tons of wire work and it was nonstop. Like we were doing rehearsals for fights and then we're doing, we're on the wires constantly doing wire gags. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work out. So you hit your head or bang up your legs or, you know, uh, so many things can happen. So, um, yeah, that one was a difficult one, but at the end of the day, when you wrap that job, you can look back and see all the cool things you did. But I'm not going to tell you that all jobs are like that. Cause like, I'm in LA right now, day playing on TV shows. And like yesterday I played a flight attendant being hit by a bag and that was like padded. So, you know, you have days that are easier and like just fun like that. I mean, they're all fun, but like, you know, some days you have easier days to like to rest, I guess you could say. So not all stunts are crazy, but the people that do the harder stunts, these are the days that we, we look forward to because, you know, we don't have to hit the ground too hard. 
but then there's jobs where you have to get hit by a car. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, that's, those are the gnarly days that you're like, Oh my God, <laughs> I can't believe that happened. And you know, you may get a concussion, but yeah, those are the days that you need to like rest and recover. And then you hope that you have like an easy day the next week or, or the day after. So, but that that's, what's like the beauty of our job because every day is a new day. You're not doing the exact same thing. You know, you're not working in a nine to five, um, like in front of a computer in which I'm blessed at because I don't think I could do that. Some people could totally do that. But, you know, some days I'm uh, like the other day, <laughs> there's this one episode we worked on where we had to act like we were like insane patients. And so we had to like knock our heads around and like act like we were like pretty much lost our mind. And it was just, the, we had the most fun that day. So like, we, I just feel like we act like children. <laughs> Um, at work so it's yeah. like a really fun and i'm super blessed to do this job i love it that sounds pretty good acting like a child at work <laughs> i do that myself but for different reasons and fortunately i'm my own boss so you started martial arts first then you went into stunt so i'm curious how has the experience in stunts changed not just what you train but maybe how you train yeah, I mean, I think in my t early 20s, like I did anything and everything. I was like, you know, falling on the like the floor without pads, like um training nonstop like for multiple hours um because you can, like when you're early 20s, you're about, you feel invincible. But now that I'm older, yes, you have to train differently. Um and I've learned over the years that training has got me hurt. <laughs> and then you can't be hurt at work. So like I've sprained ankles, I've hurt my knees, I've uh I've temporarily dislocated my shoulders. So and that's just from training. <laughs> so uh, yes, you have to take it easy, you know, not go as hard, make sure you stretch and warm up your body before uh doing any type of session. Um so now I know that because you can't just be like you you just can't be uh you know wild mm -hmm. <laughs> anymore and just go crazy and you know you got to really take care of your body. And I noticed like recovery is a big thing too. Like I really take care of my body doing chiropractor and massage and acupuncture. Like I'm a big advocate for like healing because they'll help you train better in the future. Mm. Yeah. 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 What you're talking about reminds me of the way pro athletes talk. You know, they'll go oh. into training and, and, you know, yeah, they have days, maybe like a, like preseason or, you know, when they're, when games are far off where they'll hit it hard, but for the most part, they're looking to maintain skills and to recover and just kind of stay in that top form because then when they go out to games or in your case, when they go out to work, they're putting it all out there and everything else has to support that so they can show up the next day. Yeah, exactly. Super important. And martial artists have to do that too. Even you know, when you're training week by week, you have to take care of your body. So, cause like, if you're doing judo, you're doing tons of balls. Like if you're doing takedowns with, you know, in c lot class, like, yes, you make sure you take care of your body make sure your partner understands your body. And if you have any issues going on with you, so yeah, definitely be communicative with people. Mm. Absolutely. You mentioned a pretty prominent name you know, Guru Dan and Asanto. Yes. What's it been like training there at his school? It's been amazing. Like, uh, he's taught me so much about martial arts and his humbleness. And, you know, he's, I think, 82 now, I think. Um, that sounds right. And yet he still is hungry for learning and he has no ego. If he does like a technique and he like calls up someone like, hey, show me this technique and he'll tell you which technique he wants you to do and you accidentally do something else he's like oh yeah that's that's correct but you know that's not the one we're doing but yes you can also do it like that he doesn't ever scold anybody um you know he he believes that there's not always one way of doing things and he explains that there are 25 different ways to do one technique and this school does it this way and you know i like doing it this way but this person's body may not work as well so he really makes it 
he customizes things so that it works for you. And he lets you know that, hey, it's okay if it doesn't work with you, for you that way. Because, you know, everyone's different. And, you know, some martial artists I learned, they're very like, no, it has to be like this. This is the way we do it. We don't do it like that. Like, you know, it's, uh, he's very open-minded. Let's just say that. And I really, really learned that from him and, um, not righteous at all. Like I just really look up to him and I just see that translating to like other parts of your life, you know, just being open-minded with life. Mm. So that's what the main thing I've learned from him. And, uh, it's really opened up my eyes a lot. Mm. Yeah, he's he's an amazing man, somebody that I hope someday to not only get the opportunity to train with, but to have on the show, because I've never heard a single person say anything negative about him. Yeah, he's amazing, literally amazing. And all his students I, that have trained with him for years, not only move similar to him, but like have that same attitude about life. And I think it's a beautiful thing that he's, was able to spread that seed of wisdom to so many people. You brought up ego. What's it like in the stunt community? Do you, do you have, are there, is there a lot of ego or is it tempered because people are getting the crud kicked out of them even when they're doing it right? Of course, I think there's egos. I think there's egos in every industry though. Um, it is a male dominated industry, but I see it is transforming now. Um, you know, back when I started, women, like, if they had a suggestion for a fight move or a uh, fight, choreo, fight choreo, you know, they wouldn't really take them as seriously. Or uh, if someone had, like, a, like, someone had, like, a suggestion, like, you know, sometimes the boss would, like, turn them down. But I'm seeing more and more nowadays that people are, are actually more open minded to hearing people what their opinions are. And I, I even noticed that with women, you know, um, people are listening to me more and asking my suggestions, which is like, mm. you know, super flattering now. And, um, I don't know. Yeah. I think it was an ego based industry and I think it's transforming for sure. And I don't know if it's because of like the changing times most definitely. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I see people being, uh, less egotistical maybe, you know, mm. and, um, it's been a really great journey to see this business transform and I'm seeing more women coordinators and it's pretty awesome to see that. And even w women directors. So the whole entertainment industry is changing and evolving. Yeah. Th things are changing pretty rapidly and it's, it's wonderful to see. I, you know, it looks like in, in our lifetime, we're going to be able to look back and, and just marvel at how far, we've come, it feels like things, not only is it changing, but the rate of change is accelerating. Yes. Yes. Which is awesome. Yeah. It, it's a really cool thing to see right now. As you've traveled and trained and worked and really worked on some amazing projects, I'm sure there are a lot of stories and I was hoping you might share a couple of those with us, you know, give us some behind the scenes, some stuff that maybe the listeners wouldn't know about oh wow um let's see uh like what kind of stories like um just on set i guess or well the way i typically ask this question is tell us your favorite martial arts story mm. so you can you can take liberty with that however you choose <clears throat> man i mean Favorite's a tough one because, I mean, I just enjoy training every day and, you know, I have very limited time nowadays, so my training is not as often as I like it to be. Um, so I really relish in going to sessions now or going to class and I really enjoy like going to new cities and finding like what schools are the best schools there. Um, so yeah. Um, Man, that's a tough one. Um, Maybe an impressive injury. <laughs> those those always yeah. go over well. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple. I got I broke my nose twice actually from kicks to the face. Um, the first one was sparring, sparring session at Jun Chong School. 
and I was sparring with like this teenager at the time and he was, you know, teenagers are good. <laughs> he was a boy teenager. He was like super fast and we, we ended up going pretty hard and I thought I could hang with him and I could for the most part. And then he literally caught me doing a spinning hook kick to my face and, uh, yeah, I had blood everywhere. <laughs> had to go to the hospital. Um, Yikes. yeah, that was the first broken nose. And then the second one was completely different. Um, in C lot class at Guru Dan school. Um, we do, we, it's called like play, like play. So like, you know, it's like kind of like sparring, but more like friendlier. So like, uh, it's kind of like Hoda, like in Capoeira. It's similar to that, but it's sea lot. So, but it, which is also very similar to Capoeira, but we go on our knees and do kicks from the knees and on your, um, on your bottom, we sit on the floor, which is a little different than Capoeira. Um, and me and my friend, Paul, we're just going back and forth and then, um, ooh, like we're having fun, literally laughing and throwing kicks to each other. And then um, all of a sudden I, I went in the wrong way and he spin hooked, kicked me too from the floor, <laughs> same thing. And then I got knocked back and had to go to the hospital, another broken nose. And they had to like set it back in place. So yeah, I've had two broken noses just in martial art classes, not at work. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure lots of martial <laughs> arts. I'm sure lots of martial artists have broken noses. It's like yes. a common thing. Yeah. I, I I don't know too many martial artists who have been training for a while who haven't broken something. I mean, I've yeah. got a, you know, I I, um, I took a good shot in the face and one of my teeth is a crown, broke a finger at one point, you know. So Yeah. It happens. Yeah. It ha I mean, it's it happens. It's rough out there. And as one of my instructors was always fond of saying, look, it's better you learn how to take some shots in training with people that care about you and know how to react to that and how you're going to feel taking those shots and, you know, heaven forbid you end up out on the street and in an altercation. Yeah. And that's the first time you ever get hit hard. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When yeah. you think, of, when you think about the instructors and the people that you've trained with, I mean, you, you've, you've worked with a lot of people and I'm sure a, a long list of very amazing people. We've heard a little bit about, Guru Dan, and, and of course, I think most people listening to this show know who he is. Mm -hmm. But who else? Who else would you want to tell us about that maybe has contributed to who you are today as a martial artist? Um, Jun Chong at uh, Jun Chong Taekwondo School in LA. Um, he was actually my first instructor, and he's a very gentle man, but very strict. Um, and he has a lot of discipline at his school and a lot of his students really respect him for that. And I think that's why a lot of parents take their kids to his school because he does, you know, he doesn't let people just get away with things. And I feel like in this society, kids are getting away with a lot of things. And I think discipline is a good thing. Um, it creates who you are as a person. It creates like, you know, um, structure and, uh, discipline and, uh, I don't know. I think it's an important lesson in life in general. Mm. And then he like makes us meditate after class. And I think that's a beautiful thing, you know, to clear the mind, you know, because you're doing an aggressive art. So you have to balance it out by meditation. So he usually makes us sit down and, you know, settle in our minds for the last like five minutes of class. Um, and, and, and June, Master Jun Chong has like taught me so much, like from square one when I knew nothing. And he was, you know, very uh, patient with me and, you know, very kind. Um, yeah, he's just an amazing man as well. And, you know, he has a ton of students and it just shows how much love is in that school as well. Mm. A lot of the people that we've had on the show of turn martial arts into their profession have had some resistance from family, you know, whether it was going into stunts or acting or opening a school, you've found a way to turn martial arts into a job like all of them. What's been your family's yeah. response? 
Well, uh, I actually have a business degree. <laughs> so I always thought I was going to be a nine to five, or I actually dreamed of it. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to work in San Francisco and you know, the financial district, that's what I'm going to do. Um, until I took a finance class in college and I was like, well, this is not for me. Uh, I just, I just didn't, I just didn't understand it at all. I was just like, what did I get myself into? But I I had to finish what I started. So I did get my degree. Um, and that, that was about the same time when I was in college training martial arts and, um, you know, starting to get in the stunt business. Um, and I, uh, I genuinely thought it was just a phase like, Oh, this is what I'll do for right now. You know, I'll get that job later. And my mom was, and my parents were like, yeah, yeah, this is just a phase. She's not going to really do this for the rest of her life or for a big portion of her life. So they just thought it was just a like fun little phase making like a little bit of money. Um, but then it exponentially grew over time. And I was like, oh, wow, this is really fun. I love this. I can't imagine having a nine to five job. Um, and then my parents were like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, when are you going to get that real job? And I'm like, I don't know. So uh, they're still waiting, but uh, but um, I don't think I am. I, I think this is this is my career now, whether it's, you know, behind the scenes more and like helping with like assistant coordinating or, you know, in the future maybe, but right now I really love performing still. And I think I'm going to keep at it for a little bit more. Nice. I think you should. (laughs) It seems like it's going well. Yeah. Why would you stop? If you could train with anybody anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? I get asked that a lot and I'm always like, really? why don't I have I an answer? I thought that was my question. <laughs> People are stealing my question. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> other podcasts have asked me that. And you think like, okay, everyone, I, like everyone, and I have said Bruce Lee, oh, and everyone like, that seems to be like the go-to. But yeah, I mean, he is like, he trained with Guru Dan. So he learned so much from him and uh, obviously he would be one of my top choices. I mean, I'd be scared of him a little because I don't know. Cause he's so iconic and like, you know, he's kind of like a God to all of us martial artists. I would definitely be scared of him, but yeah, I think just to see, or even just to watch him, he, I don't not even have to train with him, but just watch him like train. Cause I heard he was just so fast. Mm. And his fitness level was on another level. Um, yeah, just to be like a fly on the wall when he was alive would be really cool. Um, I actually work with Jackie Chan and that was really cool to work with him. Like? Yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, I got to work with him on Rush Hour 3 and he uh, he is so hardworking, you know. he If he's not like, doing a fight scene or helping look at shots or going over shots. He's cleaning the floor. He's like, he is so, uh, he is just so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, I have a blank mind right now. Really cleaning the, cleaning the floor. Even as as huge a star as he is, he doesn't take, he he won't take that downtime. He just goes. No, he just goes. He (sighs) is, an amazing person and that just shows like martial art like how he is a true martial artist you know you're never too good for anything and you know he'll do the grunt work and you know he he has no ego as well you know Uh, he just wants to get the work done and yeah just get on to the next shot you know whether he has to sweep the floor himself he will do it (laughs) Yeah. And it's super creative and funny and generous. So yeah. Um, who else? I have, I, um, I say his name wrong. Uh, Eco Uwas. Eco Uwas. Uwas. I'm like the I, worst. I'm not with, convinced like, I'm corny. saying that right either, but so somewhere I, in there. I, uh, I want to train with him, but I did also work with him on a uh, mile 21 mm. and he he is so kind and so sweet and no ego as well. Like definitely true martial artists. And he is very loyal to the people that helped him. 
And so he'll bring them on to his projects now that he's made it big in America. Um, he brings on like his people, which I really think is really awesome. And I think family is a big, you know, a big thing for him. Um, and I, I would, he would always tell him on set, I'm like, I want to train with you. I want to learn some tech, like see a lot of techniques. And he would just laugh because, you know, we're so busy. We didn't have time to do that. But I just really wanted to train with him. I think he is amazing. And I think he's, you know, he's t- kind of taking the place of Jackie Chan's, you know, uh, you know, path right now. Mm. So I think it's really cool to see that. And, you know, seeing it from an Indonesian star too, is really cool. And, you know, people are opening up their minds to that because, you know, what other Indonesian star do you know of, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. His, he's utterly impressive and anyone that hasn't seen any of his work really should check it out because we're seeing this progress, this growth in stunt film. We, uh, just recorded an episode uh, talking about Ong Bak and the mm-hmm. launch of Tony Jaw and how really prior to Tony Jaw, the only major martial arts actor, at least that I was aware of, who was doing the majority of his own stunt work was Jackie Chan. Yeah. Oh, and Jet Li as well. Does he do most of his work? Okay. That, that I did not know. It's, oh, I, you know, I, I know he does a lot of it. And I okay. know, well, obviously, Eco does a lot of it. He yes. is amazing and fast. And- his technique is impeccable and he'll hit the ground with no pads. Like now he's a true stunt guy. (laughs) And so as we see these martial arts actors come up and doing their own stunt work, does that give you any inspiration to do work beyond stunt and, and take more spoken roles? Yeah. I mean, um, I've done some small parts here and there. Like I worked on iron Fist, and I had, I had the opportunity to play one of the Crane sisters and have some lines. And that was, that was so fun. Um, I don't know if you know who Andy Chang is. He's also an iconic martial artist, stunt coordinator, second unit director, uh, director. Uh, he was actually on Jackie Chan's stunt team. Um, he, I'll, I'll be doing a film for him actually acting. Cause he always believed in me as an actor and uh, from like a very young age when I started. And so, yes, I will be doing an acting role at the end of the year or the end of next year, actually. Can you tell us anything about that project? Um, let's just say it's out of this world. Okay. <laughs> and, we're shoot- and we're shooting uh, in another country. Oh, so. okay. Yeah. Nice. We'll, we'll keep an eye out for that. Yeah, definitely. There's certainly a lot of adrenaline doing martial arts in front of a camera, you know, on set, stunt work and all that. For a lot of martial artists, the place that they feel that adrenaline is in competition. Did you ever take your skills out into into the ring in that in that sense, be it you know, full contact or or you know, point sparring or forms or anything? Yeah, when I was at Jun Chong school, uh, I did compete. Um, not very often or not uh, that much because I was already doing stunts and was getting a little busy, but um yeah, I did forms competition. Uh, I did sparring competitions and I come from a sparring school. So it was, you know, um, yeah. So that competitive act aspect was always there. And then, you know, I loved it, you know, when I did spar and then over time you get, you know, hurt <laughs> <laughs> and then your ego gets bruised a little here and there. Um, I, I don't know if I love it as much now that I'm older. Um, maybe like friendly sparring. I don't mind, but you know, I'm very conscious of not getting hurt now. That's a very big goal of mine. So I, I don't really do it anymore, mm. but yes, that competitive aspect was in me. Um, and definitely before Jun Chong, cause I remember going, I used to work at an MMA gym a long time ago called legends. And it was owned by Randy Couture and Boz Rutten. Um, it was in Hollywood. And so I used to work there and I used to train there. I used to take Muay Thai and boxing classes there. And we would spar a lot. And I would get my my butt kicked const- <laughs> <laughs> constantly by girls and guys. Like it because I, you know, I wasn't that skilled back then. And um, but I wanted to do it. That's when I wanted to do it the most, actually. And I was like aggro. I was like an aggro 21-year-old or 20-year-old, I think. And so, yeah, but then I would get my butt kicked constantly and it like kind of schooled me in a way. (laughs) Where did that aggression come from? 
man, I don't know. I don't know if it comes from growing up because I grew up in a rougher city. Maybe I grew up in Stockton, California, which I know is famous for the Nick and Nate Diaz brothers, but you know, it's not, I don't know. I guess I always felt like I had to prove myself when I was a kid. Like, yeah, I could do that. I could, I could do that. So I was very much a daredevil uh, since like a young age. And I don't know why I always felt like I had to prove something, but I felt like I did. Mm. So maybe that caused like my aggression. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have to confess that doesn't line up with the image I had of you talking about dance. When we talk, <laughs> you know, when we talk about someone being a dancer, we tend to think of someone being and and you know it's it's my own it's my own stuff you know i'm not you know i'm not meaning to generalize especially since clearly here i'm wrong but when we think about dancers they the images that we see on tv and in movies are of people who are a little more reserved we'll say rather than aggro yeah i mean i think with anybody i think everyone has layers and so yes you do have that composed part of you and then you other you also have another side of you that you know have to like prove yourself that you're worthy or you know i mean i remember people would be like i dare you to do this and i would do it and then like i remember one time i was like in grade school and we we're like at great america and uh i was wearing someone's hat and it flew off the tram and so i was like they're like, oh, you're going to get that? And I'm like, yeah. So I jumped off the moving tram, <laughs> not knowing that it was dangerous, but, you know, and just got it. I could have really hurt myself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and the, I just did things without even thinking. Mm. I think a lot of kids are like that, though. So. Absolutely. But did it get you into trouble? Did it get you hurt? Um, you know... I felt invincible. Like I remember doing front flips in heels at clubs when I was 21. Like I was just crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, I guess it did, but I just don't remember. Maybe it's all the concussions I've had. Like I don't <laughs> really remember. <laughs> Probably. Oh, I think I did. You have to ask my mom. She remembers way more stories when I was a kid than I do. We'll have to do a follow up with your mother. Get mm -hmm. her, get her name. <laughs> Tell us all the dirt about you. Yeah, she will. <laughs> Moms are good for that, aren't they? Yeah. I don't think there's a mom reminded. out there who, who won't, you know, both brag and, and sell their child down the river at the same time, yeah. telling all the old they stories. remind you of all those stories. <laughs> and you're like, what? That was me? <laughs> I don't remember that. That couldn't have been real. That didn't happen. Yeah. That doesn't fit my narrative. <laughs> exactly. One of my favorite subjects to discuss with martial artists is the subject of their own challenges. You, we've, we've talked a little bit about some of the physical stuff and you, you kind of just opened the door a little bit here. So I want to I wanna go through that a little bit more. Martial artists have this skill set, this toolbox to handle things physical and emotional. You talked about meditation that most of the rest of the world just doesn't have. It's one of my personal favorite things about martial arts. I'd love for you to tell us about a time, about something that you went through, something tough, and I'll let you define that however you want, and how you were able to move through it. The first, like, I'd say 25 years of my life has been like roller coasters. Uh, a lot of up and downs and a lot of like dark things have happened in my life, like people passing or things I've gone through that was really hard, which put me in definitely lulls in my life um and then once i found martial arts that kind of transformed things i was able to learn about meditation and um being still and um before the martial arts everything was a roller coaster and i would have highs and then lows and highs again and deep lows um but then once i found the way i felt like the middle way was the way and Things now in my life are more constant. And I'm not saying I don't have a lot of joy in my life because I do, but I guess it's more stoic in a way where um, things don't affect me as much as they did before. I'm not as dramatic about things. Um, and because of meditation, I think it's, it's created 
a calmness, a stillness, a stoicism. Um, so like things that may have bothered me in the past don't bother me as much. Like you're not as emotional and it's, it's kind of like how Buddha was like, he always said the middle way is the way. Uh, and I think I really took that to heart when I learned about that because, you know, life is going to throw you so many curveballs and, you know, things that you can't control, but it's how you respond to it. Right. So, and it's just like sparring. So if you, if someone's like angry, angrily kicking you and going at you just because they really want to just take your head off, how are you going to respond? Are you going to fight back with fire with anger and try to hit him hard too because he's trying to hit you or are you gonna just just be like a, a spectator and like okay he's going through his thing you know do what you can avoid it but you know maybe it'll change his energy as well because it's not about hurting people it's about training so I think it's just that, you know, and that I think in the past when I used to spar, I would get angry if someone like hit me or if they were going hard because they wanted to. And I was very reactive. And, you know, that's what causes a spike, right? Like you get really angry and mad. So you're at a, a big low. And then once you hit that person, you're at a high, but then they're at a low. So it's like that, that wasn't the middle way at all. And I noticed that with that training at Guru Dan now, it's like people are very calm and chill. Like for the most, most people are. A lot of the veterans are very chill because they've been doing this forever. You know, what do they have to prove? Nothing. So uh, yeah, I've learned that through the way of martial arts, meditation. Um, and it takes practice because, you know, obviously you're not going to be happy every day or in the middle way, but as, uh, at least I'm more consistent now. Uh, you know, if there's traffic on the road, you know, I'm way more chill. I just put like an audio book on now and not like cutting off people like maybe I did when I was like in my early 20s. But yeah, I think uh, it's just practice and it, it, it's about keeping calm and uh, finding that middle way. Definitely. And of course, easier said than done, right? It, it takes a lot of time. Oh, yeah. It takes a lot of effort. Yeah. And if we have somebody listening who maybe is newer to martial arts, who is relating to what you're saying, you know, cutting people off in traffic and, and having a hard time, you know, balancing out those highs and those lows, where might you suggest they start? I think just maybe five minutes be before your day starts, just maybe listening to meditation music, just five minutes and just calm the mind. That's a good start. Five minutes is better than no minutes or at the end of the day, reflecting on like your day. Um, or even like if something happens immediately, don't react, just stop, take one deep breath and then try to go from there. Yeah. Sage advice. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's switch gears. What's your favorite martial arts movie? <laughs> oh man. Um there's so many. There are. It, it, it's funny. Actors or, or anybody in the film industry really has a hard time answering this question. Yeah, because not only do we work on a lot of them, <laughs> um, but we watch so many that it's like, how do you just narrow it down to one? Um, you know, you obviously there's that. If, okay. that. if that's easier. Um, okay. Well, I have to say game of death. I mean, mm. obviously it's was, <laughs> it was made so long ago, but um, you know, it inspired me to make my own little fight scene based on the game of death, which I'm going to be releasing very oh, soon. Cool. Um, oh, I'm pumped to see that. Cause basically uh, the warehouse fight where he fights different martial arts. Originally he was supposed to fight different martial arts. And the whole idea of it was where at the end, he combines all the, the great things of all these martial arts to create JKD, which is his martial arts. Um, so I thought that was a really beautiful thing that he paid homage to that. 
in a movie, which, you know, he obviously died before the movie got finished, but that's what the idea of it was supposed to be. So I made my own version of that where, cause I've also trained in many martial arts. So I, uh, I guess you have to see it. I'm going to release it in like a couple months. So you definitely be on the lookout. It'll be on YouTube, yeah. but I'm wearing the yellow jumpsuit and um, oh, you'll cool. get the idea of it. It's, it's it really uh, takes everything. What our whole interview was about into like a five minute fight scene. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm really excited to share that with everybody. Um, but yeah, he's inspired me in so many ways. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you've heard about my Kali Diaries. No. It's, uh, Tell us about it's that. It's actually, a, a, I release it on social media, but it's basically when I started Kali, I wanted to see my progression as a Kali artist. So I just made all these fights um, using the techniques of Kali and um, di- did a diary, like a literally, I literally did like a video diary of my training but in fight form. So you can see it on YouTube under my channel, Lauren Mary Kim. Nice. Nice. And in case anybody missed it in the intro, uh, we do link all this stuff in the show notes. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll link everything that we're talking about here. And I've got a question for you because this, this is a, a longstanding theory that's only, there have only been a couple, couple people who have not fallen in with my theory here. Was Game of Death your first Bruce Lee movie? I think it was. Yeah. Or Enter the Dragon, maybe. <laughs> Whichever so mo- <laughs> movie is, the, is their favorite tends to be, almost every time, their first Bruce Lee movie. There's something about your first Bruce Lee movie. Yeah. That you hold close to your heart. I don't, I don't know what it is. For me, it's Enter the Dragon. That was the first one I saw. And that's the one that is most special. But for plenty yeah. of people, it's Game of Death. I think I just like the meaning of what it was, even though it, you know, it turned into a little something different at the end, but, um, but what he, what he was creating in his mind of like the different martial arts that really resonated with me mm-hmm. and how he, uh, developed JKD because I mean, it's a beautiful thing that he re- literally took the best things that he thought worked the most efficient in each martial arts and turned it into his own. So. We've talked about a number of actors today, people that you've had the pleasure of working with, people that you, you know, it sounds like you want to work more with. If you could pick one, just just one person, and you had to, let's say, work with them and no one else for the rest of your <laughs> career, who would that be? Oh, man. Uh, uh, let's see. That's really hard. <laughs> I mean, does it have to be like? Hmm. Could be anybody. Anybody. Um. Maybe. Maybe Eco. Mm. I had a feeling you'd say that. Yeah. Because I would imagine that being in your shoes, you're not just looking at who's going to be challenging and and yet enjoyable to work with, but who are you going to learn from? You talked about your desire to learn. Yeah. You know, there's a lot there, certainly. Yeah, just to pick his brain would be amazing. And a question that I've been asking people in the film industry who've come on lately. If you were given an infinite budget to design, produce the ultimate movie that you would be involved in, who would it star? What would it, you know, what would the genre be? What role would you play? You know, t- tell us a little bit about that. You know, somebody plunks down a, you know, we'll say a couple hundred million dollars and, and they say, you know, Lauren, make, make, make the movie of your dreams. We'll get out of the way. What would, what would it it's be? actually not a martial art film. Okay. <laughs> totally fine. Tell us about it. Um, it, it would actually, it, it's this idea I've been toying around with for the last couple of years. It's actually about autism. Um, and how it relates to spiritualism and spiritual aspects of autism and uh yeah it would be a movie about like a woman who uh has an autistic child and basically um she's like at a low in her life um 
her husband leaves her, her and then she finds her way through her child love and her child teaches her all these lessons in life that she never knew about and she took for granted and um sees her child as a gift versus a burden so i think it would be more of a a, a story about yourself and learning about wow. who you are as a person through another being another soul yeah yeah it sounds pretty powerful hmm. thank you for sharing that yeah thank you Let's look to the future. What are your goals as you look out the next you know, year, five years, 20 years, however far you want to look into the future? Tell us about what's coming down the pipe for you and, and what you're working towards. Um, it's funny because like the whole last year I was working on TV. Um, and I love TV. I've worked in TV for a very long time. And the, this next project called Stargirl that, I'll be, that I worked on is you know, one of my career highs because we got to do some amazing things with wire work and um, just creative shots that I've never had to had the opportunity to do before. But I was always telling people like, I want to do film. I want to do films next year. And I actually have an opportunity to work on a film this coming year. I actually am leaving soon. Uh, I can't say what it is, but it is kind of big. Um, so I have that. And then I have that movie where I get to, I have an acting role. Um, and then after that, I might take some time off to like, you know, work on my, my own personal life, maybe, maybe have a child. Um, and then from there, I wouldn't mind stepping into more assistant coordinating or doing more of the administrative work, um, taking a little break, but, um, but I'm not going to stop. I'm a, I, I just can't imagine not working, doing something or, you know, maybe start writing again and, you know, just, I like to be creative. So I'm always going to be doing something wherever it takes me. It takes me, I guess. Mm. Right on. And if people want to find more about you online, you know, website, social, you know, give us all that stuff. Um, I'm pretty active, I guess, on Instagram. So my name is Lauren Mary Kim on that and my YouTube channel, which is also Lauren Mary Kim. Great. Nice and easy. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you being here. And we always ask guests for one more thing as we wind down the show. What parting words or wisdom or advice would you want to leave everyone with today? I think uh, exactly what we were talking about earlier, you know, uh, finding the middle way in life, you know, uh, not reacting, being humble, um, just be a good person. I think. And the day, what kind of footprint do you want to leave on this planet? You know, were you a good person? Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, something to think about for everyone, right? I had a good time with this one. Really enjoyed talking with Miss Kim. And I have to say, I can't imagine that her career hasn't peaked yet. I, I just have a feeling on this one. We're going to see some really big stuff coming down pretty soon. And thank you so much, ma'am, for coming on the show. I really appreciated your time and your conversation. If you want to learn more about this episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, sign up for the newsletter, check out the show notes, see everything we've got going on over there. When you're done with that, go to whistlekick.com. Check out the products. Use the code PODCAST15. Get yourself something nice. If making a purchase isn't in the cards right now, but you'd still like to help us out, you can share this or any other episode Follow us on social media. Leave us reviews. Google, Facebook reviews are great. And you can make guest suggestions. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There's a form there. Tell us who we should be talking to. Our social media is at Whistlekick. It's all over the place. And my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>